Uh, well, my name is Charles Dalton. Um, I'm the general forecaster here at the National Weather Service uh, office in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our bread and butter as an agency is, is the protection of life and property. And, and so the primary you know, way we do that is through uh, the issuance of uh, watches and warnings. So uh, you know, when your TV gets interrupted and your favorite TV show with that tornado warning or thunderstorm warning, uh, we're the, the, the kind of the background uh, reason for that. Uh, that's, that's, that product comes from us. Uh, so your thunderstorm warnings, tornado warnings, uh, winter storm warnings, um, you know, any weather related warning uh, that comes from the government is from uh, the National Weather Service. So there's, um, you know, there's a number of different, uh, you know, agencies or, or owners of uh, the various sensors and equipment that we use. Uh, so like, for instance, the FAA, uh, they own some observation points that you see at uh, various airports. Um, the National Weather Service owns some of them. Uh, we have things like river gauges uh, for the rivers and hydro side of, you know, hydrologic side of things that are owned by the USGS. Uh, so there's a number of different agencies. Well, for example, our radar is a, a tri-agency thing. There are three partners uh, that, that you know, got together to um, you know, fund and, and deploy those. Um, you know, military and the Weather Service uh, were part of that. So, um, and then, of course, we use, you know, pretty much we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're greedy when it comes to data. So we use anything and, and everything we can get our hands on, uh, including volunteer networks like uh, the Coco Ross stuff, if you've ever heard of that, it's, heard of it. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an, an acronym um, for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Observing Network. Uh, so it's basically just volunteers that sign up uh, through the Coco Ross website um, to report in you know, 24 hour rainfall uh, as well as any hail and snow amounts they get. Uh, so we pull you know, anything that, that is credible and, and reliable information uh, that we can get our hands on, we, we pull it in because all of that helps, you know, kind of create a, um, you know, a conceptual model for, you know, what's going on with the weather. Um, so even things like webcams, you know, during snow, snow events, uh, we'll monitor webcams or traffic cameras, you know, so the new yeah. Arkansas DOT uh, web cameras are going to be fantastic for us, you know, uh, to kind of watch and see how road conditions are changing you know, during winter weather. Most people are very familiar with, well, if you're a weather, you know, kind of a weather-centric person, uh, most people are very familiar with you know, forecast models and radar and satellite and things like that. Um, but really, you know, uh, uh, in the old days, if you will, um, a way to get very connected with what's actually happening in the atmosphere right now was, uh, was map analysis. Um, and so you have something like this where you've got, uh, you know, a map of uh, you know station uh, plots printed off, and it's it's you know the map analysis part of it is a way to get you kind of intimately familiar with what's happening now, what's the ground truth now, because if you don't know where you're starting from, in terms of you know what kind of weather is occurring now, it's hard to build that conceptual model of, of where we're going. You know, so this is a way to look at things and say, okay. <clears throat> You know, I've got uh, I've got convergence along a, a frontal boundary here, or I've got a, a wind shift here, so the front is located, you know, in such and such place. Um, it's also a way to look at you know data and kind of do a quality control on things. You know, every sensor that you that you use has limitations, so whether that be radar or satellite or, or you know surface observations, uh, they have their limitations. They have uh, ranges in which they are you know uh, you know operating uh, efficiently or correctly. Uh, so if things fall outside of, you know, uh, you know, if they're not calibrated correctly or if they fall outside of that range, you know to toss it out. Um, so where that comes in, you know, tying that back into, you know, model data or radar, you know, satellite information, things like that. Um, it's a way to, you know, if you're, if you're analyzing the map, if you're doing surface or hand analysis, you know, okay, where your high pressure is centered. So if the models initialize and they're slightly off, you can kind of calibrate your thinking in, in terms of how the models are handling stuff. So again, it's a way to build that kind of conceptual model, if you will. And the models get better and better every day, but this still kind of keeps you uh, grounded in, in ground truth, if you will. Yeah. So walk, walk me through how you, would, how you would do that. Well, you know, it's kind of, uh, kind of a benign weather day um, across uh, you know, the central part of the U.S. Um, but essentially, uh, it, it's, it's kind of an art form. Uh, so, you know, any one of these, um, what we call uh, uh, station models here, um, you know, you've got, uh, in, so let's just take this one for example. So the, the, the black bold output on the upper right, 
uh, is your pressure uh, in millibars. Um, and uh, the, the upper left is your temperature, the bottom left is your dew point, and then you can see these little barbs off of all of these. That's the direction uh, from which the wind is blowing. So if it's, out of, you know, if it's oriented like this with the little barbs on the end, it's blowing from the southeast to the northwest. So, you know, how we do this uh, in terms of analyzing it, it's really kind of like connecting the dots. Um, so you have certain intervals uh, or certain rules that apply to, um, you know, analyzing surface maps or uh, even upper air maps. Um, so, you know, we would start off, I'll just erase this real quick. Uh, you know, we would start off at uh, 1,020 millibars. So these, these digits here are, are uh, to a tenth. Uh, the, the far right digit is tenths of a millibar. So we would start off at like 10, you know, 1,020 millibar. And you, you essentially just go through and kind of connect the dots. So uh, this would be, you know, 1020 on the dot. Um, and you can see from, uh, so, you know, air flows around uh, low pressure, you know, counterclockwise. So you've got winds out of the northwest here, you know, kind of the south. Uh, here across the Texas Panhandle and southeast, so there's you know some degree of, of low pressure here, and you can see you know 1,020 pressure decreases as you get towards the Colorado Kansas border, and conversely, it's going to increase as you go to the to the east. So, um, so we would just come through here and and uh, and connect the dots really. And there's some there's some art form to this. You know, there's some rules about um, you know your what I'm drawing here, by the way, is uh, what we call isobars. So it's it's a line of constant pressure. So your isobars can't cross. You know, so there are rules, you know, meteorological rules and, and analysis rules that that takes place. But you know, basically, just come through here and kind of connect the dots. You know, and there's some you know subjectivity to this. So you know, here's uh, is 1019.7 millibar right here, and here's 1020.5. There is no 1020. But you can kind of interpolate between these two and figure out, you know, exactly where this is going to go. So, you know, it's going to be closer. 1020 even is going to be closer to 1019.7 than the other way around. So you would bring, you know, somewhere out in this region, and then, and then we would wrap down in here somewhere. So that gives us a starting point down there, and then we kind of come back up in here and. I feel a little bit like Bob Ross here. Paint a happy isobar here. And so, you know, there's 1,020 plus millibar here in Little Rock and 1,023. Uh, so you would have, you know, it's 1,024 up here and uh, that's probably flipping Arkansas. So 1,020 and you would wrap in here and 1,022 uh, here in Pine Bluff. The Monticello is a little bit lower, so I wrap around like this. And so this would be 22. Just put some markings so you know you would draw a, a high pressure symbol in here. Uh, that would be in blue. There's there's rules uh, uh, that regulate uh, what color you know. So like a cold front is always aligned with you know the triangles on it. It's always blue. In warm fronts uh, is the line with the half circles that's red. Right. Uh, uh, the symbols for low pressure centers are, are red L's and, and capital L. The cursive L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, of course, I didn't conveniently didn't bring my colored pencils over here, but uh, we, we get to color as adults when we do these things. Um, uh, so you would put the blue H uh, centered here in Arkansas, where the where the high pressure is centered at. And I'll do a 16 here, and we'll we'll get the uh, center of the low here in Colorado. Swing down in here to southern Colorado and then there's a 10-14-8 there. So that one's 10-16 on the dot so we'll swing through that and pick that up and then you know, so something like that. So in here you've got There you've got your your low pressure center. If you look at the Storm Prediction Center, every day they do map analysis on every single shift, and they they analyze from the surface all the way up through the, the mandatory levels 
uh, you know, 850, 700, 500 millibar, and then the jet levels. Um, but that's why they do it. So they know exactly where things are, you know, physically, and how to compare that to, to where the models are at. And so they, they form that conceptual model in order to, you know, put out the forecast for the severe weather aspect of things. So, so when, it's, when software does this, it's doing essentially the same thing, just with an algorithm between those points? It is, exactly, yeah. It's, it's using, you know, numerical prediction or calculations, and it's, it's doing exactly what you're, you're doing by hand. Um, you know, but again, like what this, the benefit that this offers is you have to physically go and look at all of these observations. Um, so you're not just looking at something that's already done for you. Uh, now you're, now you, you know, much like writing something down by hand helps you to memorize it, you know, now you're physically involving yourself in the data that's out there. So now, you know, I was doing a, a 7 a.m. map analysis earlier just to kind of, you know, familiarize myself before this interview. So I remembered that in northern Illinois there was a station that you had to kind of account for. Uh, right, that was whereas an algorithm would only have the data that it was programmed to know about. Yeah, and it, and, you know, it may very well do uh, something extremely similar uh, to what I'm doing. Sure. Um, uh, but it may be slightly different. I mean, from a numerical standpoint, it's probably going to do a better job than, than I'm doing because it's, it's able to calculate distances to, you know, to a precise you know, measurement. Uh, whereas, you know, like I said, here in Texas, uh, you know, I've just got to go between the two uh, or here on the Texas-Oklahoma border. Whereas a computer is going to be able, you know, it's going to check the distances between these two mm -hmm. and it's going to know precisely where to put that line. Right. Um, so there is a little bit of subjectivity to it. Um, but what a computer can't tell you uh, is, um, you know, okay, I, I've got to remember to account for this, uh, this station in northern Illinois. It, it can't, um, you know, it can't build that conceptual model for you in your brain. Um, so that's what, you know, really digging into the data uh, here, um, you know, can, can, it's the benefit of it.